and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Esther Arkaj, and I'm an academic trainer for the Center for Teaching and Learning. We are thrilled to help support the SAS webinar this evening. Very brief housekeeping items to cover before I pass it over. Remember, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted, it will be posted on the CTO LibGuides webinar page. We encourage you to ask questions and have conversations in the chat. We have some wonderful student and NCU alumni moderators tonight. And with that said, I am passing the introductions of tonight's webinar, Tabitha Mayat. All right. Good evening, good afternoon to, to some. Thank you for taking time to join us today for our publications and presentations, Pathways to Success webinar. Um, we thank you for supporting us in these endeavors uh, that we host monthly to encourage collaboration. And so um, without further ado, there's a couple of things that I wanna highlight before I get started with the formal introduction of our speakers this afternoon. Um, uh, want to ensure that you guys take note, as Esther mentioned, to post your questions, comments in the chat uh, feature so we can respond adequately. Also, we request at the end of the webinar, you should receive a survey. Um, please provide us your feedback so we know uh, what to look forward to in the future for future webinars and presentations. In addition, we just want to give you a heads up uh, that we will not be hosting a July or August uh, session, webinar session uh, for IPE. However, we will resume in September. So we encourage any feedback that you may have via the comments, via the surveys that we send out uh, of interest for upcoming uh, webinars related to IPE. Again, thank you. So I'll get started. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our very own uh, you know, faculty and students for this evening's webinar. Um, we have Dr. Brenda Stevenson Marshall, uh, who holds an MPH in Policy Planning and Regulation from UC Berkeley and an MAE in Applied Economics from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor and a PhD in Health Services Organization and Policy from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Dr. Stevenson Marshall is a health policy analyst economist, strategist with employment and research experience in public and private health systems. The past 30 years or more, um, she has spent in academic, uh, academia and tenured faculty as program director and academic dean positions. So welcome, Dr. Marshall. We also have one of our very own now alumni, Veronica Shake. Um, she's been a registered nurse for 10 years with experience in several different specialties and leadership roles. She received her Associates of Science and Nursing degree from Los Angeles County College of Nursing and Allied Health and her Bachelor of Science degree, nursing degree with honors from the University of Phoenix. Veronica is North Central's most recent MSN graduate. Congratulations, Veronica. Emphasizing in management and organizational leadership. She loves learning, teaching, helping others, and spending time with her family, which we here on IP committee can attest to. Um, we also have with us Debbie Chambers. Debbie um, is a global health researcher, health promoter, and MPH coordinator at National University. She enjoys volunteering on the engagement and mentoring committees at American Public Health Administration uh, section. Ms. Chambers is pursuing a doctorate of health Administration at North Central University in San Diego, California. We welcome you all and thank you for taking time to share with us. I'll turn it over to Veronica. Well, thank you. We, uh, like Dr. or like Tabitha said, we super appreciate you being here. And so I'm actually going to turn it over to Dr. Marshall because she will be starting us off today. Hello. We're so pleased to be here. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for your interest in learning more about publications and presentations to separate but necessary pathways to success. And we're going to explore the four no's into why you will want to include publications and presentations in your enhancement portfolio. So the next slide. It will build your career profile. 
I speak from personal experience on, on this, this component. It establishes your academic and your practitioner credentials. It also creates options for you. If you are currently working in corporate America and you'd like to be an academic, the best way to do it is to show that you really do have the ability to cross that bridge or to integrate the two. And the best way to do it is through publications and presentations. Next slide, please. You know, Shakespeare once said, to thine own self be true, and it follows as the night the day, thou shalt not then be false to any man. Well, translated for us, it means know your stuff, don't bluff. Don't uh, try to pretend that you're an expert. Someone is going to be there who may be the expert or who just wants to see you embarrassed. It can be a real career inhibitor. So know where you are on the knowledge pyramid. If, if you're new, say so. Um, if you're new to your profession, if you're new because you've transitioned from one area to another, just say hi. This is my first time out. People will respect you for that. So work from your level of expertise. Next slide. Please. One of the best ways to build and to really broaden your ability to uh, make posters and, and presentations and, and to publish is to know your venue, know your outlet. Uh, for us in healthcare management, we strongly support the Journal of Healthcare Management. And that would be the American College of Healthcare Executives. I can't overestimate the importance of having a professional home in one or more organizations. It, it is just extremely important. You can join the student group if you're still a student. Uh, and that would be at a greatly reduced rate. You can start to, to network with, with students. Um, you can submit a poster. You can submit perhaps um, a topic for discussion during the annual meeting. Uh, it's a great opportunity to network. Uh, my very first and only Robert Wood Johnson grant came because I paid my way to a conference. Uh, they were starting a, um, a health administration section in NASPA. And uh, I was junior faculty. I didn't have travel money. So that's what credit cards are for. And I ended up getting the grant and um, working with others. And we actually had our work published in a special edition. So um, don't be afraid to take risks. Uh, next, next slide, please. Here are some professional organizations uh, with that all emphasize in one way or another health administration. The American Public Health Association, uh, the Nurses Association, AUPA, the Association of University Programs in Health Administration, and the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice because we have a blog site. And if anyone is interested in blogging on a topic uh, that has to do with the integration of health and management, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk with you. Next slide, please. Here's an important tip. If you're just getting started and you really want to work with others, know that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Join an interprofessional team for publishing and presentation. If you're a beginner, this will help you to grow your knowledge base and it will increase your likelihood of having a publication or a presentation. Next slide. 
you'll be able to network and find other professionals who share your interest and career goals. And I can't overemphasize having a strategic plan. This is so important. If you're going to be part of a team, come together and strategize what you're going to do. Um, are you going to do just a single poster? Are you going to do a, a series from a single topic? Um, are you going to rotate authorship? Um, these are all uh, important components that you that you want to sort sort out in advance. Next slide, please. And Veronica is going to share with you the journey from poster going forward with our own IPE committee members. So Veronica, you're on. Well, thank you, Dr. Marshall. <clears throat> so like Dr. Marshall said, my name is Veronica Shake, and I am part of our Interprofessional Education Advisory Committee. And so I appreciate this opportunity um, to share this part of the presentation. Dr. Marshall has great knowledge about the publication and publishing process. And so in a little bit, you'll be able to hear um, Ms. Chambers talk about the international side of things. And so then I get to talk to you about the kind of more local poster side of things. As Dr. Marshall mentioned, finding an interprofessional team who shares similar goals and interests is super helpful for publishing. It's also helpful in creating connections to different opportunities. Um, for example, in within our our committee, Dr. Mast, who's our faculty co-chair, is also a member of the AUPHA, which is the Association of University Programs in Public Health Administration. And so in December, she brought to the committee an opportunity that the AUPHA was accepting poster proposals for their annual conference in June and wanted to know if we were interested in submitting something related to our IPE committee. All of us were very interested in taking advantage of this opportunity. And so we discussed, prepared, and um, submitted a proposal for a potential poster in February. The really nice thing about submitting a poster or submitting a proposal is you don't have to have everything done all at once to submit a, a proposal. You just have to have the general idea, which is really nice because then it allows you to take this big, seemingly uh, Herculean task of publishing, it puts it into bite-sized pieces. So that's super helpful. And so we, um, you only have to have the general idea. You don't have to have everything. Only when you get accepted, then you, do you have to flesh out the stuff. So we took January and February to prepare for our poster, or our poster proposal. March, we submitted it, and then we were accepted it, and in April and May, we worked on it a little bit more. So we divvied up the assignments. We spent April and May collaborating and going back and forth to create a catchy title, a written and audiovisual introduction, the poster itself, and supplementary resources and information before the annual conference in June. So because of the pandemic, we did not get a chance to present our poster live. However, next slide, please. We were able to, well, I had the op awesome opportunity to attend the conference in person, which allowed me to network and talk about our poster in real time, even if there was no actual presentation of it. The AUP AUPHA had a virtual poster hall which was nice because then it is, it means that our information is available not only for the duration of the conference, but for a longer period of time. Because of this, our poster was also, when you looked at the virtual poster hall, our presentation, our poster was the first under the list. And so then that allowed us to be um, more visible. We were able to talk about it to people that we met at the conference and then we our, our poster was at the top. 
Um, so this slide just kind of gives an example of what the AUPHA's virtual poster hall format li looks like. You can see that it has our title, our written introduction, our video, and then a, our poster and our resources. So that's um, if you if you have the chance to do a virtual poster hall, then this is what it might look like. Attending the conference and seeing how other people set up their posters and presentations was helpful because it gave me new ideas and perspectives and it opened up a broader pool of people with which to collaborate and different avenues and suggestions that I might not have thought of on my own. So next slide, please. So then moving forward, my or our plans and goals for this project is to transform the poster into a publication. One of the APHA members that I met at the conference, again, networking is important, um, suggested the Journal of Health Administration Education as a place to start. This is a quarterly peer-reviewed journal which chronicles educational research, case studies, and essays by leading health administration education or educators and professionals, as well as students. Another plan is to, to apply for a grant from NCU. NCU is, quote, committed to our core pillar of graduate culture through supporting innovation in research and scholarly contributions to society from its students, both current and alumni, and has put aside honorary funds to my students' completed work and research. Now, they don't uh, award for that, but you can apply, um, and I would encourage you to apply if you've done other research. I also and I see my connection is unstable, so let me know if you can't hear me. But I also want to continue collaborating with the IPE committee. And if we're able to publish in more than one journal, then like Dr. Marshall said, you kind of rotate being first author or corresponding author. And then finally, um, this experience has made me interested in looking at other and pursuing other publications and opportunities. I'm a member of a few nursing organizations, so I regularly see calls for abstracts and proposals. But to be honest, I've never taken any of those seriously. I just kind of look at them and think, okay, cool, let me go on with my life. Um, but having this, this experience where it was a successful, a positive experience, we were able to meet with people who um, had already gone through this, this journey before and work with them. It makes me more motivated and more excited and way more interested to actually review that call for uh, abstract or that call for a proposal to be more interested in doing it again, since I already have my feet wet in this arena. So, um, so it was a great experience. And so now I turn the time back to Dr. Marshall. Oh, next slide. Sorry, I was still on mute. Um, I think what is just just to add to this as as, as a footnote, I, I cannot uh, overestimate the entire concept of working together and developing a strategic plan, and and knowing who's going to be on first and and who is 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 going to be second, and exploring a variety of journals. I throughout my career, which is, as I said, 30 plus years, I cannot tell you uh, how many times I have worked with other teams where we have rotated. So this is this is really important. Another and, and, and final comment here is, know that patience is a virtue and success has many faces. And consider every revise and resubmit and reject as an opportunity to review what you've done uh, and start over again. Have a list of journals, have a list of, of professional organizations. Know that this is much like seeking another position. Uh, and in fact, it may lead to another position at some point. And with respect to patience and success, I'm going to turn this over to Debbie Chambers, who has an amazing story that spans the globe, and she's going to share with us. Debbie? 
Thank you, Dr. Stevenson Marshall. Next slide, please. I come today to you to share my story, my global health research journey. I'm a mother, a student, a researcher, wife, full-time employee. And my journey in global health started in August 2016 when I attended my MPH internship in Osnabrück, Germany. And I had always wanted to serve in a capacity whereby I could go back to my original country, which is Kenya. I'm originally from Kenya. So after one of the sessions I had in Osnabrück, Germany, I approached my faculty at that time and I asked him if he knew of any people at National University who conduct research or if he could give me ideas on how I could get involved in global health research. And he was like, oh, by the way, that's very interesting that you mentioned that you're from Kenya. I know a faculty member who currently does research in Kenya, and she also started a nonprofit organization in Kenya. And she would love to meet you if you're open to communicating with her through email. So I was very excited. I was like, what, what are the odds of just having a random discussion after class with my faculty and being connected with somebody that I think would be very instrumental in my journey? So I went back to my room that evening. And before I even settled in, there was an email that came through from Dr. Zolnikov, who you can see is pictured there. And she told me that my faculty had reached out to her and she mentioned that uh, she does research in Kenya and she wanted to know my story. So I told her my story. I told her that I used to serve in squatter settlements with some students, medical students from Loyola College in Chicago. And I fell in love with public health at that time. I didn't really know what public health was until I got involved with those students in our volunteer capacity. And we would go out to squatter settlements and we would conduct medical camps. So my work was mostly just to be a translator to them because I speak Swahili and they needed somebody who understood and spoke Swahili. So from then on, she was like, okay, tell me about your research interests. What do you want to do? So I told her I would like to continue practicing what I've been doing. I was working in Texas before we moved to Illinois at that time when I'd gone for the internship. And I was working in a breast cancer unit, oncology unit as a certified nurse assistant. And I would take care of patients who had cancer. And that's where my interest in breast cancer came about. So after we moved, I was wondering, how can I continue doing this work? And since I'd gotten into public health at that time, I thought research would be a good way to continue with what I've been doing since I'm very interested in that. So I gave her my background story and she told me, do you know of any organizations that you could start with? So I mentioned Kenyatta National Hospital, which is where we used to do the voluntary work. And that's how the journey started. So this is kind of a little bit of my introduction to let you know that don't be afraid to reach out to your faculty. If you have a dream, if you have a desire, you have that spark within you don't be afraid to share it with somebody. Talk to someone, talk to your faculty, who, whoever it is that's leading you through that uh, particular semester or term or quarter, whatever session you're taking, you could mention that. And from then on, you never know what doors will open for you. So throughout the months, we continued. And then in November, around November, I started the process of the research. So I reached out to National University, you have to get IRB approval first before you can start anything. So I reached out to National University and they granted me the approval. And then I traveled to Kenya to file my application. So in December 2016, I submitted my application to start the research process. And it took a little bit of time. There was a medic strike going on at that time. I don't know if any of you has ever thought that it's possible that doctors and nurses could ever take a break from their work and just go home and leave the patients in the hospital to take care of themselves. So that's what was going on at that time when I submitted my application. So that journey completely stalled. We couldn't really do anything at that point. And 
you will get to see that this journey was not anything easy that you could think you just submit an application and then it goes through. It took a little over three years from the time when I put in my application to my approval from Kenyatta National Hospital, the IRB team. So after I went through that process in 2017, I went back home after two weeks in 2016. I went back home, then 2017, I continued reaching out to them. It took a little over five months before I heard back from them. And then they said, okay, we can look at your documents and then we'll start figuring out if you qualify to come and conduct your research at Kenyatta National Hospital. So let's move into the next slide, please. So here you'll see a little bit about Kenyatta National Hospital. That's the largest hospital in East and Central Africa. It serves a lot of patients who come from all over that region, mostly East and Central Africa. We have patients who travel from as far as the countryside. It, it takes about eight hours, eight to 10 or 12 hours uh, in a bus. They'll travel to go all the way to Nairobi. This hospital is located in Nairobi, Kenya, and once they get there, it's not automatic that they'll see a doctor because they'll get there and they'll find that there are other patients who had already arrived as early as 3 a.m. They were waiting at the gate to be seen by an oncologist, and you will find there's probably only one oncologist serving hundreds and hundreds of patients. So there's a lot of resources that's needed in this particular area. And these are some of the quotes that I got from the interviews that we conducted. There was a Christmas break at that time when I started the process and most of these patients would go there and they would expect to be seen over Christmas break but it takes forever for them to be seen. The CT scan is not working at that point. There are no resources. Sometimes the machines break down so they'll have to wait for like about three months before they're seen by a doctor and when they try to find out what can I see the doctor they'll be told well you'll have to continue waiting. It's not a guarantee that we can provide the services that you need. And some of them, they would wait five months to get a surgery done. So the ease and the resources that we have here in the United States, which sometimes, honestly, we take for granted because we complain about the food in the hospital or the bed that you're sleeping on. <laughs> it's, not, it's not something that patients on the other side of the coin would complain about. They would just love to even just sit and listen to somebody talk to them about their condition that they're going through. So as from this course, you can see, they go through a lot of hardship. Sometimes the medics would even be at the hospital, but then they would not be able to see them because they're on strike. They would like the their needs to be met by the Ministry of Health. You would go there, you can sit and wait for a whole day, and no one will treat you. It's very disappointing for those patients. And sometimes the chemo medication, which we see here in the United States is readily available, is not as automatically available as you would see in some areas like at Kenyatta National Hospital. Next slide. So for this collaboration part that I'm trying to emphasize, I would say that it is just so important for you as a student at North Central University, do not shy away to approach your faculty, talk to your peers. If you have that spark within you, you have that passion, you have that perseverance, and you have that drive to conduct global health research, it starts somewhere. Talk to somebody, talk to your faculty, talk to Veronica, reach out to somebody and say, hey, I'm interested, Dr. Marshall, do you have any ideas that I could take away from this experience? I'm interested in doing this, how do I start? If you don't know someone like me, I had no idea what global health research was all about. And in fact, I hadn't even taken a global health research course by that time when I was talking to my faculty. So what that experience opened up for me was opportunities to conduct research, opportunities to collaborate with other professionals. I got involved with other professionals, not only from North Cent and not only from National University at that time, I also met other professionals from Kenya who I collaborated with, like this gentleman here. He's a senior oncology nurse at Kenyatta National Hospital, and we're still communicating until today. And I've managed to travel to the American Public Health Association to present my findings from that global health research that I did in Kenya. I also got published at the Lancet Oncology, which you probably have an idea of how 
difficult it is to even get somebody to take a look at what you have. But they took a look at this girl from Kenya <laughs> who had absolutely no idea what she was doing when she first started the process. But it takes a lot of channels for you to get there. You need other people. You need to collaborate. You need to reach out by faith. You need to be persistent. You need to be patient. It's, it's a long process. It can take as more as three and a half, three, a little over three years for me, or it could take two months, it could take a year for you or something different. But all in all, don't ever give up. Just keep knocking at those doors. Keep asking for help. If you don't understand what you're doing, don't be afraid to fail. Like I failed so many times. And in fact, initially when I submitted my application, they rejected it. They said, well, you're you're just a student you're studying out you don't even really have experience conducting research in kenya what makes you qualified and what makes you think that you could travel all the way to kenya and conduct research i told them i'm a kenyan let's start there the fact that i live in the united states does not disqualify me i'm a kenyan and i have that passion i have that drive i would love to do this so give me a chance. So that's how it started. I was so confident, but inside I was shaking. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't really know if this will work. But Dr. Zolnikov really encouraged me and told me, even if you fail, don't give up. Just keep knocking on those doors. And that's what I would tell you guys today. Don't ever give up. Keep knocking on those doors and do not be afraid to fail. Growth and strength can come from challenges. So I'll pass this over to Dr. Stevenson Marshall to continue from there. And you're welcome to ask any questions if you have. Thank you. You're muted, Dr. Marshall. And to get something there there can you can you hear me now yes, we can hear you all right well i don't know if you can see this or not but you can see maybe part of it it's an african blanket it's a blanket that was woven um by and and one of my students traveled to africa uh, i secured funding for him he was a missionary and uh, he wanted, he was working on his master's in public health and he wanted to go to Africa to do his internship or his, 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 uh, his project on, on caregivers. And um, it, it took really quite an effort to secure the funding. I couldn't believe how many people said to me, well, that's just not an appropriate undertaking. And uh, it took, time. We finally got the funding. He left his family in Cleveland. I was I was teaching in the business college I was in Cleveland, Ohio at the time. And he he left his family. He traveled to Africa. He was there for six months. He came back and one day he appeared in my office with this lovely blanket framed. And he, he thanked me and uh, I get a little cheery thinking of it, but I still have it. It's going to hang on one of these walls one day, but it's just another example of you simply don't give up. Um, perseverance. So the final slide. I think we have one more slide, right? So why are we on this journey? Well, to reach the light and ascend the towers at the end of the pathway. Well, I know that kind of an elevator inspirational approach. But if you really are serious about your career, serious about what you are doing, what you want to do, you want to maintain that professional footprint. It's going to lead you to career options. And most important, it, it, it will keep you in charge. You, you want to always be able to say, well, perhaps if this doesn't work, there will be another opportunity. There will be another option. But if, if you're not aware of, of your surroundings, if you're not aware of the venues, if you're not aware of how to network, you're going to be out of options. 
So um, hope that in some way we have helped you today, this afternoon. If you have questions, I think we have time. Tabitha? Oh, I think we do have, a, there is a question slide. Uh, one more slide. Questions? Yes. And then how to, how to contact us. Here we are. Awesome, great presentation, ladies. Very informative and yes, the chat is on fire with um, some words of wisdom and I'm loving the acronyms, Dr. Jones. And oh my goodness, Dr. Geiger, thank you guys so much. I'll um, just rattle off some, I'm scrolling through to see if we have any direct questions, but um, I like this. When you get a no, uh, that means next opportunity. I like that. Um, what else do we have here? It was one other one, fell. She mentioned something about fell. Um, so Dr. Jones, as I'm scrolling through to find it again, if you wanna just chime in, um, you can. Um, fell, here it is. First attempt in learning, keep at it. I like that. Um, persevere over fear from Priscilla. Um, lots of thank you, amazing stories uh, for Debbie. Uh, for the team. Any direct questions that anyone may have? So Tabitha, there was a question um, earlier in the chat. It asks, how do we find or network for this team? Okay. Pilar, are you talking about like, which team are you talking about specifically? If you're still there. Just as uh, Polaris chiming in, we are definitely in the comments. Uh, so you can meet us there, um, reach out to us there, submit questions, post comments, engagement there. We definitely encourage that um, as, a, as a platform to, to do that and, and join us in any endeavor. Um, as always, direct emails, um, reach out to the team. Well, and I think for networking, part of the biggest thing is to actually go out and, and put yourself out there to meet people. You know, if you go, if you're going to a conference, um, try and try and meet someone at least at every luncheon or reception or anytime there is a food opportunity, go and meet someone with that opportunity. Make sure that you actually... Um, when I went to the AUPHA conference, there were people that I got introduced to, there were people that I introduced myself to, and then there were people that I introduced others to. And so it's the thing of being willing to, um, Debbie is a perfect example of perseverance and making that no be a next opportunity. Dr. Marshall showed how patience and being willing to put yourself out there uh, publishing and, and networking, it requires energy, it requires effort. And so then you have to be willing to put that effort out um, to make those contacts, to make those connections. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But even at the times that it doesn't, it gives you that experience to be able to grow on. Thomas Edison said he didn't um, find a, a hundred ways uh, to fail at, at making light bulb, he found 99 ways not to make a light bulb. And so then it's, you, you change that perspective to where anything positive or negative you learn from. Exactly. Yes, and, and I would, I would like to offer uh, another um, illustration of what can happen when you try to transition, say, from corporate America to academe. Uh, I worked for Kaiser Permanente for a number of years. And um, we have a phrase in Kaiser that says you're Kaiserized, which means you've adopted the culture. And uh, I, I left Kaiser to attend graduate school. I was in graduate school for 10 years. I returned to Kaiser as a health economist and then I left again to become an academic. And uh, one day in, in one of my classes, a student came up to me and he said, you work for Kaiser, right? And I said, yes. He said, you know, Kaiser is looking for a research director. He said, they have a, a, a grant to start a clinical trial in Cleveland, Ohio, looking at case management for the elderly. He said, but they want someone who knows the Kaiser culture. And he said, why don't you apply? Mm. 
And I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm junior faculty, I'm tenure track. And he said, well, you can do it part. He said, besides, you can publish from it. So long story short, I interviewed, I got the position. I was with Kaiser as a research director for five years. I, I gained tenure based on the research I did for Kaiser. Uh, I cannot tell you how many publications I got as a result of being that research director, which was completely compatible with my being an academic because I did most of the work in the summer, um, some of it on the weekends. And the final, the, the ending to this story is that unaware to me, I was placed in a pension account at Kaiser and I have a small pension from Kaiser, <laughs> <laughs> which was an absolute shock to me. I, I was doing this because I needed to have grants. I needed to have research experience. I needed to have the publication takeaways and it turned out to be so much more. So um, you can make that transition. It might be something about corporate America that you can bring to academia where you can integrate the two. And um, I consider that to be one of the major takeaways from my quote, integrated career. Awesome. Okay, I'm checking. I don't see any questions in the chat. Veronica, did I miss any that you're aware of? Or is anybody on that would like to ask any questions? I see Esther. Yeah, there was a question that may have been accidentally sent to me, but I just want to make sure it's brought to your attention. Um, the question is, I've published seven times and never done a poster. What is the reason for doing one? So uh, part of the difference is just a different opportunity and a different experience with a poster. So you might have a um, different ability to connect with people and it's usually more, more of a specific audience, I would imagine. Um, so with, with a poster, it's kind of a, or it's a smaller, more bite-sized way to publish. And so then you can use those to kind of jump off into a publication or you can take a publication and kind of recondense it or make it more concise into a poster. Um, and so they, they both have a similar, um, similar purpose in that they are both a, a way to publish, but they have just a little bit of, of a difference because of your audience, the amount of work and research and time that goes into it and um, just the different availability. So and Dr. Marshall, if you've got more to, to add. Uh, it's a different venue and it's actually less demanding. It's like a blog, it's a blog with pictures. And so if you're exploring ways to, to introduce yourself uh, to a professional organization, or if you want to start networking, or if you have a team and, and the team wants to start working, it's much less rigorous. You don't need to have a literature review. Um, you can simply have some ideas. I'm, I had a student once who wrote a paper uh, on rehab and, and the opportunity cost of rehab. It's, it's the emotional opportunity cost. And it, we, we did not have the rigor of the publication, but we were accepted at APHA's annual meeting for a poster. And that I was as far as it, as, as it went. But it's, it, yeah, Veronica's right. It's, um, you're putting your toe in the water. So if you've published, why don't you look at all your publications, take them out and see what you can do with them. You might be able to make a poster from each one and, and just uh, really expand your CV. Definitely. I feel like a poster is a little less intimidating than writing a paper or a publication as well. So then it's, it is a little bit, uh, so with my education, I did a, an associate's and then a bachelor's and then a master's, and then I'm planning on continuing for a doctorate. Doing that stair-stepping is a little bit less um, scary, a little less intimidating or overwhelming than going from nothing straight to a doctor, a doctorate. 
And so I kind of feel like with a publication, then doing a poster is kind of that stair stepping that then gives you that confidence to build upon it to do something bigger. Debbie, there's a question for you. How do you multitask and survive <laughs> and still smile? That's probably something that we all need to expound on. We might need a webinar just to address that particular topic. For me, I prefer to stay organized and that's how I get things done because I work full time. We all know if you have young kids, I have young kids. My first one is eight, second one is four years, the last one is 16 months. So having three little ones and then you're working full time and I write children's books on the side just for fun, but I love doing that. And I'm a wife too. I'm a student at North Central University, almost done with my course is approaching my dissertation. So how do I stay organized? I start my day early. If you start your day early when your kids are sleeping, guess what? You can get a lot done. So I do that. And then throughout the day, I take frequent breaks. I don't just do like one major break and then try to rush everything in. I'll take frequent breaks in between. I work from home, so I'm able to still see my kids and take care of them, connect with them get my work done, attend my Zoom meetings. I have a calendar. I have a whiteboard, a huge <laughs> one in my working space where <laughs> I OCD jot down everything that I need to get done because I have meetings, I have assignments, I have life. <laughs> so I, I'm a visual person. I put my things down, I write. I use my calendar as well. I use my cell phone to put down all the important notes. I use my Google calendar. I use my Outlook calendar. <laughs> so the whole point is be organized. If you're organized, you can get a lot done. And I was reading something on Twitter yesterday, somebody who was just telling people how he has six kids and he has kind of a life that's similar to me. How he gets things done is he plans out his week ahead of time. So you don't wait for Monday to plan out the whole week. You have a weekend where things are a little bit more relaxed. So you could take advantage of that. Your Saturday, your Sundays are more relaxed. So think about how your week is going to be plan ahead so that if you have emergencies, you have all kinds of things. We know life happens in between. When things happen, you've already figured out how you can get things done. And then for me, from a mom point of view, put your kids to bed early. They have school the following day. Don't wait till 10 p.m. is when you're <laughs> is when you're rushing them to bed. If you put them to bed like between seven and eight o'clock, you'll have the rest of the evening to get your assignments done. And don't wait for Friday to get your assignments done. Take a little bit of your assignments, do them on Monday, do them on Tuesday, do them on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Then by the weekend when it's due, you've already done a bunch of things. And literally that's how I've gotten through NCU. <laughs> I've had a lot of courses. I've never taken a break since I started. It's always been one course after the other. And that's how I've managed to get things done. Just be organized from the beginning and you'll get it done. It's possible. Awesome. We have a I'm 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 honored to uh, to have been asked to chair Debbie's committee. I believe she's going to teach me. It might be this is going to be the true case of reciprocity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we have a question, we have a couple questions in the box we want to get to before we wrap up. Uh, from Aaron. Any advice for connecting with academics, finding research opportunities, specifically in the virtual world? My advice would be join the professional organizations that Dr. Stevenson Marshall was talking about. We have ACHE, we have APHA, we have all kinds of organizations out there. And as you already know, North Central University keeps championing these organizations. And you've probably been in other forums whereby they encourage you to join them, join them. Join them, join them, join them. I cannot overemphasize how important it is because that's where you connect, you collaborate with people who would be so instrumental in your journey. If you wanted to conduct research locally, you'll meet people who are already doing that. So you can learn a lot from them. If you wanted to conduct global health research or whatever kind of level of research you want to do, you'll meet these professionals. We have people working in academia, a lot of professors. We have people working for the government. You'll have so many different people that 
you'll meet through this organization and you have the annual membership fee that you'll pay you can sacrifice that latte or that starbucks drink that you like to get <laughs> just sacrifice it put your funds together pay that annual fee and benefit learn from all these connections and grow from that that's awesome. what i'm doing and it's working for me and to piggyback off that feedback debbie um and team do the organizations have student discounts yes yes, yes. they all do have the, with, with, and some of them have scholarships mm -hmm. um the uh, apha uh, health administration section of which i have been a member we offer student scholarships to the annual meeting. We offer six from health administration. We pay the registration fee. Uh, sadly, we don't pay the plane fare of the others, but um, there is also a student discount. So yes, I, uh, all organizations want students because students are, are really the the heir of parents. We we have to have students. We 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 have to have that that lifeline that keeps the organization growing and strong and vibrant. So by all means, just go to the website and check. I agree. Out. Well, and with kind of with what Debbie said, with going back to that networking in a virtual world. We are all here on a Zoom meeting, so we are all networking virtually right now. And so I think that with, with the pandemic, it has changed the ways in which we network and for better and for worse. And so then there are a lot more opportunities virtually to connect with these organizations, to connect with people globally that there may not have been three years ago. And so I think that there are definitely opportunities. And if you go to those those organizations that you're interested in find the ones that are that meet your passions that meet your professional goals that meet your um clinical or educational goals and kind of get involved with those and then that will definitely allow you to uh, network awesome any other questions from anyone on tonight this afternoon this evening um, Debbie, just a heads up, Lisa Serrato in, in the comments or in the chat, she has a fantastic, it seems like a fantastic opportunity for you. And so I um, sent a message to her to make sure that she emails you. Anytime anybody has any questions, you're welcome to email or contact any of us. And um, our information is still up on the slides. Yes, please feel free to connect. I would love to connect and collaborate with Lisa and anybody else who would like to chat a little bit more. Thank you. All right. Any other feedback? I think Dr. Marshall is talking on mute. Yeah, always on mute. Sorry. I think what's so exciting here is the opportunity for a faculty member to, to, to present with a student and an alum. To me, this was absolutely the hallmark of this presentation that the two of you really brought real life experience to what I was saying in a very pedantic way. So I thank you for that. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right. So I'm, I'm thinking. So sorry, I caught the tail end of this. I did not. Anyway, I'm so I wanted to see this so bad. Are you posting it somewhere? Yes, it's in the comments, isn't it? Or where? Uh, where is it posted, Esther? I'll, I'll be posting it to the CTL LibGuides page. Everyone who registered, I will send an email with the links to those uh, to all that information within the next 24 hours. Okay, <laughs> thank you. You're not. 24 minutes, but 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank all of you so, so much. We're just so appreciative that you would take time from your day to share part of your day with us. Thank you. Thank you all. I think, you know, what I've gotten out of all of this and through the experience and, and being a part of the NCU family, SHS and IPE and the Student Advisory Committee, get involved. 
Um, you know, also, I think it's um, something to be said about being vulnerable. And, and that's okay. Um, you know, we all come from different backgrounds, professions and expertise. And it's okay not to know everything all at once. Um, learning is something great. Um, and I've learned to appreciate that. Um, I've heard many times throughout my career and, and educational realms, just fall back, you know, take time, learn the whole patience thing, just in a different and, um, way. Um, so I can appreciate that. I appreciate the support from all of the faculty here on. Um, um, so it, it's helpful when you know you have champions um, that are on your side. So reach out reach in and work together. It's all about the collaboration. So I appreciate all of you. I look forward to seeing you on our future webinars. Please feel free to join us. Give us some suggestions. We're looking for that. How we could, you know, intrigue your interest and spark your interest. What can we do to sow into you? And what can you guys do to sow into us so we can collaborate and be effective? Healthcare leaders and inspirational community leaders. So with that, Esther, um, again, please fill out the surveys and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone.